public health uh, is often unseen. It's also always everywhere. Uh, today, public health is front and center, and we're here uh, to talk more about it. What are the basic elements of public health that influence our lives, our community, and how we respond in times of crises? Today's speaker is Dr. Victor Boberg, a professor in our college. Uh, he's got dual appointments in epidemiology and occupational health, environmental and occupational health, pardon me. Uh, uh, Victor came to OSU in 2009. I'm going to brag about you a tiny bit before I turn over the mic, so 20 seconds or so, and was the very first winner of uh, awardee of the Honors College Eminent Mentor Award. Uh, Victor takes the training of our students uh, very seriously, and uh, we're so glad to have him. He did his uh, doctorate in epidemiology at the University of Washington and spent some time on the East Coast at Virginia Commonwealth, University of Virginia, and my alma mater, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill before uh, coming over here to the best, the best coast and our, our dear Oregon State. So um, with that, uh, thank you so much, everyone. I'm gonna hide myself and turn it over to Victor. I'll see you all in a little while. Well, thanks, Allison. And let me echo uh, the thanks that she gave to the Alumni Association and to our college for, uh, for this opportunity. As Allison said, you know, this is a time where uh, public health, which is usually uh, uh, kind of a behind the scenes operation, has come to the forefront. And it's uh, great to be able to share this with you. And, and uh, thank you for taking the time out uh, today to, to come and, and listen. Um, I'm speaking today on this topic of Public Health 101, which is supposed to be sort of an overview. And I think that if you know something about public health, you'll probably see many of the strains uh, of sort of public health working their way through what I have to say. Uh, these same strains would be present for anybody who was talking on this topic, but they'll probably have different emphases just because of the sort of person I am. So if this talk was being given by someone else in public health, they probably would cover many of the same things, uh, but perhaps not with quite the same emphasis and uh, the same scope. Uh, but I think you'll see some threads that, that run through that will be common today. So this is Public Health 101. Uh, you'll see that uh, I picked the hand-washing picture there for uh, my first slide because it's so relevant to what we've been talking about the past few months in terms of trying to prevent the transmission of COVID-19 to our friends and families and communities. Uh, but my task is to give somewhat of an overview today. And rather than run through uh, a bunch of wire diagrams of how public health is organized and who gets the money and all that, which is extremely important, uh, I thought it might be a little more interesting to run through an example. Uh, and so I'm gonna start with a question to you. Uh, and that is, uh, what does a 911, an emergency call for help, uh, for an asthma attack have to do with public health? And at first blush, your answer might be legitimately, well, really nothing. Uh, I can't imagine what a 911 call has to do with public health. It's one of the most personal things that someone can engage in. Uh, but ponder that while we look at the definition of public health and come back to it. This is a question uh, that I ponder uh, as well. That's uh, the ambulance you see there is is actually a rescue unit, uh, Rescue 224 of Columbus Fire and Rescue. And when I'm not at OSU and engaging in uh, OSU activities, I'm a volunteer EMT and firefighter with Columbus Fire and Rescue. So I think about these things and how they have to do with public health. So ponder that for a minute while we talk about uh, public health a little more generally. This is the CDC's definition of public health. Um, it was coined by CEA Winslow uh, uh, actually a century ago. Uh, uh, Winslow was first talking about what is public health uh, in 1920 in a formal way. And it's a definition that has stood the test of time. We're going to revisit definitions uh, a little bit later. But this is a fairly common definition. It has to do with preventing disease, prolonging life, promoting health. Uh, and really the core of it is this organized efforts and informed choices at every level of society, all the way from you know, the high level of collect collective decision making all the way down to individuals. And you'll see that run through every definition. If you look at the first two lines, the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life and promoting health, 
that looks a lot like the definition of what a clinician does. Uh, those of you who are clinicians in the audience will probably recognize that definition somewhere in your own field. And it's been said that public health uh, has for its patient the entire community. And that's not a bad way to think about it. Public health is more concerned sometimes with prevention, but to think of the entire community as a patient is a reasonably good analogy. So let's get back to it. So here are some data. Now I'm a scientist, so I always start with data. Uh, I mentioned that that Rescue 224 was from Philomath, Oregon, a little town just west of Corvallis. Uh, those of you who are OSU alums will perhaps recognize Philomath as the town that you didn't want to speed through on your way to Newport and the coast. Uh, so this is um, last year's uh, calls for non-fire emergencies in Philomath. And you can see that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven down are calls for respiratory distress. Not all of those will be asthma, but certainly some of those are, are asthma calls. And some of that first bar called sick person will probably also be asthma. So we can look at that and say, yeah, we get a few calls that are probably asthma in our district. But from that, can we infer that this is a public health problem? Not necessarily. Certainly it happens more than not at all. Um, but we need to dig a little bit further before we decide whether it's a public health problem. And in general, if we see something out there that looks like it's a challenge, could be a public health challenge, uh, in my mind, we ask four questions and then we do them in order. First of all, we have to decide whether this is a public health problem or not. And from this information, we can't really tell. If we decide that it's a public health problem, what are the causes? It's hard to fix something if we don't know the causes. You can, but it's harder. If we discover the causes, the next question is what action should we take? And finally, if we do take some public health action, we need to ask ourselves the question, did it work? Taking public health action without bothering to find out whether it works or not results in uh, wasted effort and uh, potentially loss of resources and time. So let's take a look at some data. And this is where I always start. We can look at not just Philomath, but across the entire United States. So, and I promise that these bar charts only show up at the beginning. We'll move on to some, some other stuff here in a second. But we need to know the numbers first. That's how we, partly, how we decide whether something's a public health problem. So our first question, is asthma a public health problem? And if so, for whom? So we can look there and see that the national prevalence of uh, asthma is 7.7%. So seven out of 100 people, almost eight out of 100 people uh, have asthma, clinically diagnosed asthma. In Oregon, the percentage is closer to 12%. And we could speculate about why that is, uh, you know, grass pollen, uh, all kinds of stuff could be implicated here. But if we're looking at somewhere around 10% of the population having a problem like asthma, which can be very debilitating, right? It, it can. Uh, restrict your activities, it can restrict your ability to work, it can threaten your health uh, fairly severely, and it makes you uh, at risk for other diseases, including COVID-19. So if 10% of the population has a condition that can be very debilitating and threaten health, then eh, we might be talking about a public health problem because it meets the criteria of having a relatively high prevalence, 10% is pretty high, and the impact is fairly serious. That picture down there in the, on the right is the OHSU emergency department. And really, we shouldn't be seeing people with asthma in the emergency department. Uh, we know enough about controlling airway diseases that someone who lives in an environment that doesn't trigger asthma attacks and someone who's relatively stable on medications shouldn't be visiting the emergency department. And yet, if you look over there on the left, you'll see that there are a lot of emergency department visits for asthma. There are a lot of 911 calls for asthma attacks. And they're not random in the population. We could look at a bunch of different stuff, but I just showed one up there by age. It turns out that emergency department visits uh, are most common in young kids. And that may be somewhat due to the severity of the disease. It may also be that we're very scared for the health of our young and rightly uh, want to be reassured when they're having a challenge. But we can see that it's not distributed in the population evenly. So the next question after we do that is, let's figure out the causes. 
the causes that are behind asthma are relatively well known. There are some diseases where we still don't know why they pop up. Certain cancers, we still don't really have a good handle. But asthma, we have a, a reasonable idea of what it is that causes uh, asthma in the first place. And we have a very good idea about what triggers an asthma attack in someone who already has asthma. And you can see those listed over there on the left, family history, uh, allergies, other infections, exposures such as occupational and smoking and pollution, and carrying excess weight seem to be risk factors for getting asthma. Uh, and then the triggers down there uh, below are uh, fairly well known. Statistically speaking, there's probably someone on this call who has asthma. And if you look at that list of triggers, some may apply to you, some may not. Again, we don't know why those are, but those are the general triggers. So if someone's going to have asthma and then have an asthma attack, it's probably the reasons for that are listed up there. Then we always dig a little bit deeper and say, okay, those are the individual level risk factors for asthma. But if you look at those risk factors and those triggers, you can see that those aren't necessarily distributed randomly by individual around a given community, right? So some of them may be uh, physical activity, the fact that one person is physically active doesn't usually affect someone else's physical activity, but things like cold air, air pollutants, those sorts of things are distributed not by individual, but across the community. So while we think a lot about individual risk factors and things that put a person at risk, we also have to think about collective risk factors and risk factors that are distributed geographically uh, across place and across time and across groups of people. And that figure that's over there on the right uh, is the percentage of adults with asthma by income. And you can see that there's a gradient and it's very clear that the richer you are, the less likely you are to have asthma. And that's a little odd. And so when we see stuff like that, we can say, sure, at the individual level, poverty may be associated with higher rates of asthma, but is that really an individual level variable? Or is that also somewhat of a collective level variable? So it's true that there are things about a person's income that may make them more or less likely to have asthma, access to medical care, those sorts of things can partly be attributed to individual level factors. But there's a lot about being rich or being poor that has to do with your neighborhood, has to do with your friends, has to do with policies that may give some groups access, better access to healthcare than others that are associated with poverty. So we need to think of poverty not just as something that is at the individual level, but at the collective level. And that's really where public health shines because we can look at risk factors that adhere to the individual and deal with those, but also larger level risk factors for disease and disease outcomes that aren't individual but are more collective in nature. And a good example is asthma. Uh, it turns out that if you look at asthma prevalence by zip code, you will also see a very, very steep gradient by zip code. It has to do with things like poverty, housing, race, that are at the collective level rather than the individual level. This article here uh, is a good demonstration of that. It was about why residents of black zip codes can't breathe. And in that article, they pointed out that in neighborhoods with a significant share of black residents, all residents, regardless of race, were at higher risk for asthma. So that suggests that there's something about that place and asthma risk in that place that transcends individual level risk factors and confers risk on everyone who's in that location. And if you want to learn more about this, um, Carrie Lynn will be here on July 8th to talk about that. She knows far more about the approaches to looking at uh, this level of social determinants of health than I do. And she's going to do a fantastic job of really teasing that out for you. So if you want to learn more about that, come back uh, on the 8th. But if you look at this, uh, this is a, a term we, we use in public health that we, we want to look at upstream risk factors. So that if you look at that kind of stream of causes along the very bottom of the page, it ends in an emergency department visit for asthma. And immediately prior to that, the, the kind of 
the thing that brings that on is an asthma attack. And so we could stop right there and say, well, we need to prevent asthma attacks. And there are good approaches, very good clinical approaches to preventing asthma attacks. But in public health, we tend to look more collectively and we try to look more upstream. So what leads to an asthma attack in the first place? Well, lots of stuff. And we could put lots of arrows down there. I've just made one. Uh, asthma management has a lot to do with whether someone suffers an attack or not. So if you have good management, you're less likely to have an attack. Well, what determines asthma management? Again, lots of stuff, but one of them is clearly access to healthcare. And access to healthcare is somewhat determined at the individual level, but it's also determined collectively. And it's determined in our country still uh, by poverty and by racism. So we've been talking about both of these lately in the news, and it's clear that historical racism, structural racism, has led to disparities in access to care through a number of different means. It's also led to disparities in housing, for instance, again, through a number of different means. Both of those impinge on, an abil on the ability of an individual to control asthma and therefore lead to an asthma attack and an emergency department visit. One of the cool things about public health is that the farther upstream we get, the more likely it is that we can control a number of different conditions by attacking the upstream uh, risk factor. So for instance, if we increase healthcare access, not only would we make it more likely for people to have good asthma management, they'd be more likely to have good diabetes management as well. They'd be more likely to go for preventive care. So often upstream interventions can have an impact on a number of public health factors. And you can see some of the risk factors that I would say are associated with the very downstream effect of uh, an asthma attack leading to an emergency department visit there. So let's talk about approaches to taking public health action. So we've decided that asthma may be a challenge. Uh, we have looked at the causes both at the individual level and at the collective level. The next challenge is, so what should we do about it? For any public health challenge, there are a number of different opportunities that can be taken. Uh, for many of them, we know the science behind it and we know where it works and where it doesn't. But we need to think about for each condition that we try to address, what is the right approach? What is gonna have the greatest impact? What's most efficient? And what will work in each community? When we think about public health action, uh, we're gonna go through the next couple, couple of slides here talking about different ways to think about public health action. The first is, at what level are we taking action? The one that is probably the most closely related to public health is what we call primary prevention. And those are actions that we take to prevent the condition in the first place. So if we go upstream and we prevent the conditions that lead to asthma, then we don't need to worry as much about asthma attacks because fewer people will have asthma. Doesn't mean we don't treat people who have asthma and who have asthma attacks. But if we can go upstream and prevent the condition in the first place, uh, as has been said historically, that's the same as curing it. So if we can prevent something, that's the same as curing it. So in the, in the asthma example, what could we do? We could make sure that housing is separated from air pollution. We could control air pollution. Both of those will reduce the risk of asthma, and they certainly will reduce the risk of an asthma attack needing to be seen in the emergency department. We can also promote the reduction in smoking. Uh, it's well known that either smoking yourself or secondhand smoke can exacerbate asthma and can lead to an asthma attack. So if we reduce smoking, we can reduce, first of all, the prevalence of asthma in the first place, second, the likelihood of someone having an asthma attack and needing to go to the emergency department. So that's primary prevention. Secondary prevention is early diagnosis and treatment. So we haven't prevented asthma in the first place, but we can diagnose it quickly, we can manage it so that it has the least possible impact on that person. So examples of things we can do that would be called secondary prevention is eliminating household environmental triggers like dust, cockroaches, uh, those sorts of things that accumulate in houses and, and can exacerbate asthma. So a person with asthma can nonetheless manage it and control it by modifying the environment so it's less likely to trigger an asthma attack. 
The other thing we absolutely know works as secondary prevention in asthma is coordinated and consistent primary care management. So we know now, uh, it, this is not clinical rocket science, that primary care management of asthma with an eye towards prevention, maintenance, and patient education does wonders for reducing the likelihood of an asthma attack and therefore a need to go to the emergency department. So those are two ways that we would call secondary prevention. Tertiary prevention is kind of even farther, you know, away from primary prevention. That means we haven't prevented the condition and we haven't really done a good job of mitigating the uh, ill that can come from that condition. But there's still a role and uh, it often focuses on patient care, but not necessarily. So examples of tertiary prevention are in fact, uh, rapid pre-hospital care and high quality emergency department care. So we haven't prevented asthma, we didn't prevent the asthma attack, we can still do something by providing high quality emergency department care. For people who have uh, severe injuries as a result of asthma, their, their lungs just don't work very well anymore, we can provide people access to respiratory therapy and other approaches that will enable people to get along as best they can. And really, public health works best when we've got all of these going on at once. And which is the right approach will depend on the person and the community and the resources uh, that are available to get it done. So here is the Oregon Asthma Leadership Plan uh, from 2014 to 2019. You can go find it online, it's out there. Uh, these are the goals that the Oregon Asthma Leadership Plan had. So when they went to say, what should we do about asthma? They came up with these things right here, reduce hospitalizations, uh, increase self-management education, reduce disparities, so uh, looking at equity. And then they focused on tobacco, self-management, uh, environmental triggers, those sorts of things. And what they did was they came to that fourth step and came up with these metrics that you see on the right. Uh, if we are successful, what will happen? Well, hospitalizations will go down, uh, the number of people engaging in self-management programs will go up, and the number of folks who have active asthma management will go up as well. So they have already set up their metrics for evaluating, did this work, that fourth question. And what we do then is say, sure, hospitalizations change, self-management change, asthma management change. Did it change equally for everybody? Or were there some groups for whom this was more successful and some groups for which this is less successful? And that almost always is true that we have some people who are very successful and some people who are less. And if we can predict who those are, we kind of start that public health cycle again and say, well, what is the burden in the people for whom this program wasn't successful? And now circle back and try to figure out what we're going to do from there. So that fourth part of assessing and evaluating is absolutely vital, uh, not only in determining what works, but for whom public health works. Another way to think of public health activity is to look at this impact period pyramid. Uh, and I've taken in blue over there on the left, I've taken the, uh, the interventions that we talked about uh, on the previous slide and kind of put them on this pyramid. This is a, a pyramid that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention put together to talk about impact of public health programs. And it may surprise you that the sort of very intense individual level interventions are the least effective from a public health perspective, vitally important in taking care of patients who really need the help. But from a community impact perspective, really those upstream factors, those socioeconomic factors, change in the environment, are likely to have a longer term and more sustainable impact. And what I've done is I've tried to put some of those interventions that we talked about for asthma along the left there. And you can see that some of them clearly fall down in the lower levels. Setting housing standards, having mitigation for pollution are things that we do at the collective level. Smoking cessation is sort of in the middle. Uh, it's policy related, uh, but it also falls in that sort of middle wedge of long lasting protective interventions. Primary care access is getting a little up there towards the clinical interventions, but a lot of access to primary care has a policy flavor to it as well. And then, you know, getting people spacers, getting people medication, teaching them how to use it, all incredibly vital for controlling asthma 
in people who have asthma, they're up there at the top. It requires a lot of resources to get that done, but absolutely vital. And you can see that this list as you go down pretty much covers the entire pyramid. And a lot of effective public health interventions have something at every level. And that quote there is a good one that controlling asthma really requires a team effort of clinicians, public health, and a whole bunch of other folks that we'll get to in a minute. Another way to think about uh, these various interventions is to put them at a level ranging from an individual person up through families, communities, uh, up to policy and environment. And you can put these uh, interventions that I just talked about on this level as well. So clearly down at the individual level, we're talking about medications and devices. If you have a medication and you have a space or an inhaler, that is something you do to make yourself better. So that's very individual. Education and skills tend to be patient focused, but also family focused. Uh, smoking cessation crosses a bunch of different levels all the way up to policy and down to individual. And then access to primary care, mitigating pollution, housing standards, those are up there in the policy realm and the environment realm. But again, you can see that at each of these levels, there's something that we can do to control asthma. And if you look closely and think about it for a second, they're interrelated. The medication and the devices that are down there at the individual level depend powerfully on primary care access, on people having access to care. And that can be driven by a policy. So they're all interrelated, even though they may have their primary effect at one level or another. So uh, this is how the CDC puts that all together. Uh, th these are the 10 essential services of public health. And uh, you'll see in them some of the elements that we just talked about. So up there under assessment, monitoring health, diagnosing and investigating, that's really that, that first business of figuring out is this a public health problem and if for whom. But you look around at this wheel at the, the 10 essential services that uh, public health in the United States is tasked with, it's a really, really broad set of activities. And the people who monitor health and diagnose and investigate aren't the same people who are going to link others to care and provide care. They're not necessarily the people who are gonna develop the policies. And Karen will be here uh, uh, in one of our sessions to really talk about where one can plug in professionally to public health. You can look at this wheel and see that it's not just one group of people who put public health on. It's a whole bunch of different folks. And every discipline that's represented, for instance, in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences has a place in this wheel. And even broader than that, uh, this is a very commonly shown picture of a local public health system. You can see that really to make public health work at the community level, uh, it goes well beyond a bunch of public health professionals. In fact, you can see EMS over there on, on, the, on the left. My only gripe with this picture is that the health department is at the center. Uh, there are lots and lots of public health efforts for which the public health officials aren't necessarily the ones driving the show, uh, but are kind of farther off on the periphery and something's being led by a different group. But you can see from this that there are a lot of people involved in making public health a priority in a community. Uh, and so I hope you'll take the opportunity to come back and, and hear Karen talk about that. So I just want to come back to the, the first slide there and, and point out that you can look at these uh, reasons for a 911 call in Philomath, Oregon. And it doesn't take a whole lot of creativity to kind of look at that and say, what does this say about a community? Uh, if you look at the reasons why people call 911, if you look at the reasons why people go to a hospital, uh, if you look at the reasons that people die, you can learn a lot about that community. Uh, and in this community, you could say, I wonder why falls are number two. Uh, does that mean that we have people who are, uh, are maybe a little unsteady on their feet? Uh, does that suggest we have uh, older individuals living on their own? Does this suggest that we have substandard housing or substandard infrastructure that may lead to falls? We don't know that by looking at this information, but we can sure come up with some ideas of what we might want to look at. So you can look at 
data as individual and personal as making a 911 call and infer something about that community. So public health, healthcare, and the health status of the community are inextricably, inextricably linked. So here I said we'd come back uh, toward the end to look at definitions of public health. Please don't read these. If you wanna do a screen capture, go ahead. Uh, I believe this will also be available online. So if you like anything particular about one of these definitions, uh, you can grab it. But what I did was I went through and highlighted in these three different but fairly similar definitions, the repeated themes about science, about prevention, about taking collective action and about equity. So you'll see all through these definitions that public health depends on science, knowing what to do and how to do it. Prevention, that is at least attempting to prevent health conditions in the first place. Third, taking action collectively. Even if sometimes we treat people individually, the idea is that we're taking collective action to make a difference. And finally, equity, the notion that everybody deserves the benefits of public health. It may not play out the same in every community, but that everybody deserves the benefits of public health and to the extent that that allows uh, people a long and full life. So let's come up to the present and then we'll uh, break it open for some discussion. Uh, everybody has been following COVID-19 to, to some extent or another. And while there have been a lot of innovative approaches to COVID-19 and a lot of discussions about how COVID-19 is different from anything else. It is a different challenge, but basically we're taking the same public health approach to defeating COVID-19 as we would any other public health challenge. Is it a problem? I think we figured that one out. What are the causes? We're still grappling a little bit with that one. What do we do and does it differ by community? We're definitely grappling with that one. And finally, does it work? We're finally getting some answers about what does work and some answers about what doesn't. This is a map of COVID-19 by zip code in Oregon uh, from a few days ago. It's changed a little bit. But if you look at that, the, the darker areas are the places with higher rates. And those of you who have been following this know that you can see some of these are associated with specific outbreaks. So for instance, the one in the middle of the, uh, coast there is Newport, where they had an occupational uh, outbreak. The dark blue area in the middle is Warm Springs. And then towards the east up on the Columbia, uh, you've got an outbreak up there that uh, much of which was associated with a public gathering. So we can use data about place and zip code, as Carrie Lynn will talk about, to start to figure out where are the cases and how do we need to focus our efforts to stem COVID-19. So that's the science part of it. Uh, I mentioned that equity runs through uh, public health in general. Uh, we, we can do a much better job of it than we have been doing. Um, but nonetheless, it's something that we're becoming increasingly cognizant of infusing in everything we do in public health. And it's clear that in the current COVID-19 outbreak, there has not been equitable distribution of the disease, and there certainly hasn't been equitable distribution of resources to combat the disease. Uh, and so we can use public health to point out uh, inequities in disease distribution and inequities in resources to combat disease, and try to make it so that everyone benefits from what we learn about the public health approaches to stemming COVID-19. And finally, action and prevention. Uh, down there on the left, you'll see the pandemic resumption plan for Oregon State University, uh, which is underway. That plan is based on the science of COVID-19 and on the science of what works and what will likely work at OSU. Uh, those of you who know about the TRACE project know that o OSU is involved in a project that tries to estimate the underlying prevalence of COVID-19 in the community, a vital step in knowing what to do about it. In the center was yesterday's uh, Oregon Health Authority uh, announcement about 191 new cases of COVID-19, uh, thankfully with zero deaths. And the big picture there is the Oregon Medical Station. Some of you may remember that was set up in Salem in March and April 
when we anticipated a surge of hospitalized cases of COVID-19. I, I, that's a picture I took uh, in, uh, at the Salem Fairgrounds when we were setting up. And it has so far not been used. And I am hoping it will never be used because it will be a great example of what I hope will be a public health victory where we set up a facility to take care of the worst possible uh, outcome, which is a surge of very, very sick COVID patients, and we didn't have to use it. That, if this stays empty, will demonstrate that at the individual level and at the collective level, we took the measures needed to prevent COVID-19 before it started. And that will stand as a testimony to the effective policies in Oregon and to the effectiveness of individual Oregonians in doing what it takes to, to stem a disease. That will be a great example of a public health victory. So I'm gonna end on that hopeful note and uh, turn it back over to Allison. Victor, thank you. I wish, um, I wish we could give you a round of applause. Uh, thank you um, for such an excellent talk. I think even for folks like me who have been doing public health for a long time, it's, it's helpful to remember these key tenets, right, of uh, collective effort together, creating conditions for health, thinking about primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, um, this is your chance, folks who are uh, on, the, on the webinar, to go ahead and use that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to uh, offer up your questions. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, what questions do you have about public health in general? Uh, anything that Victor said that makes you curious, sort of leaves you uh, wanting more, a little more explanation? Uh, so to, to, to offer a question, you just click on that Q&A box and you're able to, to submit things. So please um, don't be shy. We're eager to hear from you. As, uh, as you all are writing, I, um, I have a question and I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm trained in health behavior. I also really focus on policy. Uh, and so I don't want to elevate any one particular discipline, but um, right, Victor's giving the thumbs up, uh, but you trained as an epidemiologist and, and we hear a lot and see a lot, I think, in the news today about epidemiology as a, as a discipline. And so I'd like to ask you, can you tell us again, uh, what is epidemiology? And you might help us too by sort of reiterating or offering up some of the specific elements that folks are seeing now uh, in the newspaper and around town that may point to, oh, that's what an epidemiologist uh, is doing uh, during this crisis and maybe what they're working on when there isn't a pandemic to respond to. Whew. All right, well, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll try to, to do that as succinctly as possible. Uh, so yeah, so I, I'm an epidemiologist. The, the term epidemiology is, is, as always, one of those Latin terms. It means you know, upon the people. Uh, so it has an inherently collective uh, Latin root to it. But the, the classic definition of epidemiology is to look at the distribution and determinants of health states in populations. Uh, and so the first task of epidemiology is to describe the health status of groups of people and to try to dig into what is behind that collective health status. Uh, that implies uh, that we look at not just populations in isolation, but populations compared to one another. And that is an, a, that's an inherent part of what we do uh, as epidemiologists, is look at the ex health experience of one group compared to the health experience of another group and say, I wonder why that's different. Uh, and the last part of the definition of epidemiology is always something about, and using that information to improve health. So when we look at populations and their health, it's not an academic exercise. Uh, to be uh, full professionals in our field, one takes that information and says, look, if the experience of one group is better than the experience of the other group, what can we do to inform a process that will make everyone have access to whatever makes 
health better in that other group. There are a lot of different flavors of epidemiologists at this point. Uh, so the same way you wouldn't go, you know, if you had an asthma attack, you wouldn't go to an oncologist and say, hey, help me with my, my asthma. You go to a pulmonologist who specializes in lungs. So I don't actually do a whole lot of infectious disease epidemiology. I rely on my colleagues in infectious disease, uh, both as clinicians and epidemiologists, to tell me about COVID-19. Uh, so there are lots of different flavors. Uh, there are people who operate in public health departments. There are people who operate in academic settings. So there are lots of us all over the place. But the basic approach is to look at the collective health status of a group and try to come up with what is leading to the health status of that group. And very often then we hand it off to folks, for instance, experts in health behavior, to take it the next step. I am not an expert in coming up with interventions to help people stop smoking. I know people should, and I can provide the information that suggests that would be a good thing, but it, it's up to other folks in public health to really, experts in those areas, to take that and, and run with it. So, I don't know, is that okay? I, I think that's excellent. And I mean, again, it just, it sort of reiterates for me that, that public health, it, it's a team sport, that yeah. a lot of us are thinking together about the, the many pieces and parts. And um, with regard to definitions of public health, I know I always go to the place of, this is about creating conditions for health and well-being which can be remarkably broad. And, you know, if my, if my dad were around, he would, he would focus on fire and corrections and, you know, that systems map that you showed where um, you, can, you can look at the world through a public health lens uh, all the time. Uh, and then, you know, there's this work of public health. So um, I think the definition also continues to to maybe evolve, um, and you could be more purist, uh, more of a lumper, or more of a more of a parser. Um, I want to think about uh, the folks listening, and and you know, it's there's this. In, also, in public health, we go to the so what or the now what, right? And so, for folks who are on the call or folks who are uh, watching the video, what can they do? I think to promote and advocate for public health in their community. I, I would start, um, I'll give you some time to think about that, right? What, what's in it for me? What can I do as a, as a member of my community, as a member of the general public, uh, to be a good public health advocate? And I think in the time of COVID, you know, the first thing is to think about primary prevention for yourself and your family. Uh, and what could, I, what could I do in whatever context I'm in uh, to to take some of the preventive measures um, for some folks it's simpler than for others but I think about you know being a good public health citizen and then moving on from that what would you say what are the how can our listeners be good advocates for public health from where they are now ah uh. So thanks for, for uh, allowing me some time to ponder that as you <laughs> asked. I appreciate that. Well done. Uh, so the, the, the first thing I, I recommend to folks, uh, and this probably reflects partly my own bent, is to find, find things out. You know, become, become informed. Uh, there are so many topics out there where you can perceive something as a problem and without thinking through the background to it, come up with solutions that sound great and seem like they would work, but flop because you haven't done the background work. So if you're in a community, find out where the highest risk for COVID is in your community. I mean, we, we know that COVID has crossed many lines and boundaries, but it's not random. Uh, and even in Oregon, we can see that in one county, the big outbreak is occupational. You know, it, there's a, a work site that has an outbreak and it gets out of control and all of a sudden we have a bunch of cases pop up. In another county, it's because there was a large gathering and people weren't protecting themselves and, and one another. In another area, it's because they don't have resources. So find out what's going on in your community. Uh, and then you can take individual action. I, mean, I think we're seeing with COVID that people can take 
individual action that has collective impact. Uh, you know, and uh, the 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 face covering is a good example of that. That it appears right now that most of the impact of covering your face is protecting other people and not protecting yourself. So to me, that's really a, an excellent example of a public health action that one can take that is, I don't wanna say it's altruistic because you're doing it for others, but for the collective community. Uh, and so while you are helping others, you're helping yourself as well. So I think things like covering your face make a good example of a individual action that has a collective effect. And then at the, at the community level, there are always opportunities to get engaged in policy action. Uh, it requires more effort. I and mean, let's just be honest. Uh, we're busy people. It requires effort to get engaged in public health activities at the community level. But there are always groups you can join. There are always meetings you can attend. There are always uh, activities that either promote public health action or are public health action themselves. Uh, and so I would encourage people to get out and, and do it locally. Sure, get involved in state and national politics if you want, um, but there's always stuff to do at the local level and, and you can often see the impact. You can see the impact at the community level of public health activity. It's fantastic. Yeah, there's always something to be said for read the newspaper and call your call your local representative. Um, I was told once when I was working in Washington, D.C. that if I couldn't recognize all of my state and local representatives by face and they couldn't recognize me <laughs> at, at right that I wasn't um, doing enough. Um, this is an exciting one and that I'm going to sort of blend it with something that's on my mind. We have a future student. Uh, on the, the Zoom webinar who says that the TRACE project sounds really interesting, and it is, you're right. Um, are there other projects that are part of OSU uh, that are worth looking into? And um, so maybe you could share some of the most exciting things uh, that, that you know of at the college, um, or and maybe how OSU is leading the way in public health and human sciences uh, in Oregon and nationally. Yeah, so uh, as usual, I'm going to do what the politicians do and take your question and twist it a little bit. Um, but uh, so first of all, uh, uh, to whomever posed that question, uh, congratulations on selecting Oregon State University. I hope you come and I hope you will uh, come to the college when, when you can and, and meet all of us in person, hopefully. Uh, so, so thanks. Uh, so, so to the question, I don't think I can highlight every cool thing that is going on at Oregon State University, but I might give a couple of examples. And again, they'll be from my perspective. There's a ton going on. Uh, and uh, I think Allison uh, will say later, I'm happy to answer, I'm easy to find on the internet. I'm happy to answer individual questions if you, if you have them. Uh, but as far as the, the TRACE project, my close colleague, uh, Jeff Bethel, is one of the principals in leading that. Uh, as is the the dean of our college uh, and others. As always, it's a team. It's a team event, um, and uh, they are going out to communities to attempt to ascertain prevalence of COVID nineteen in the population. And as I mentioned, that's extraordinarily important. Uh, the, for instance, the reopening of OSU and the resumption plan of OSU depends on knowing in the community that we have a relatively low rate of COVID-19 transmission. So that project's gonna be very important going forward in documenting that we're doing the right thing in public health and that it's safe for people to engage in collective activities such as going to big lecture halls, going to football games, those sorts of things. So I would urge you, you know, if you're interested in that specific topic to contact, uh, you know, if you, if you uh, do a search on, on Trace Corvallis, it'll pop right up. But there's tons of stuff going on in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences. And it's not just in public health. Uh, if you, you know, I, I kind of trip the name off very easily, but it's the College of Public Health and Human Sciences. We are very lucky in our college to have nutrition, kinesiology, and human development and family studies. And those professions, while, you know, they're 
their mainstream definition isn't public health, they're so powerfully connected to public health. I mean, think about human development and family. So much of a person's health, so much of a community's health is directly tied to how well kids and families are doing. Uh, and so I hope when you come to the college that you won't just look at public health, but look at all of the disciplines in our college and how they're interacting. Uh, as, uh, as Allison said, my own, my own work is primarily in injury and injury reduction, and some of that's in occupational settings. So I work with colleagues who are experts in occupational health and safety. That's not a field I've trained in, but by collaborating with them, we can have public health impact that goes well beyond what we can do individually. I also work with people in kinesiology to look at sports and athletic injuries. Again, do I know much about body mechanics? Not a whole lot. I've injured myself, but that doesn't really count. <laughs> so there's lots of stuff that crosses disciplines in our college, and we've done a very good job of that. But if you're interested in global health, community level nutrition, uh, all sorts of topics really kind of blend across these disciplines. And really what I'd encourage you to do is to go to the college website and look at what people are doing. Uh, you can do that before you get to OSU or after. Uh, we're all happy to open our doors to students to talk about what we're up to. And if you listen to one of us talk about what we're doing and it's not quite what you're up to, we know someone who's, up, who's doing what you're up to. So, yeah. Good luck. That's great. Um, we just have a couple of minutes before the top of the hour. So um, if you have, if you all have additional questions, uh, please know that we're serious when we say that our doors are open. Uh, we're easy to find on the internet. Send us notes. We love to hear from you. Uh, it makes us feel really good uh, about, about the work, doing the work of public health in the world. And you're right, Victor. I, um, I see our college as really going all the way from the lab bench all the way out uh, to the highest levels of policy in the extension service. We just, we, we capture um, real breadth and depth and are always happy to share that with folks.